This morning's first reading is from the book of the prophet Amos. He was some sort of farmer. It says he was a dresser of sycamore trees. I don't know how you would make a living doing that. But he was down south in Judea, with the tribe of Judah. And God called him to go north to the ten northern tribes and to deliver them a very powerful message. And he starts by condemning all of the enemies of the ten northern tribes. And they're all cheering him on. This, tri- this enemy's no good, that enemy's no good, another enemy's no good. And then he even talks about his own tribe, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, and shows everything that's wrong with Judah and Benjamin. And they're saying, this fellow really knows how to speak the truth and tell it like it is. But then he got to Israel, the ten northern tribes. And we have this passage. Well, you're manipulating currencies. You're treating the poor like dirt, buying and selling them for a pair of sandals. You're even diminishing the Sabbath by working on the Sabbath. You're taking every grain of wheat from the field and selling it because the common way of helping the poor would be, yes, you'd make a harvest, but you'd leave the gleanings in the field for the poor to come and pick up what was left over, and by doing that, they would survive. But because they were taking every little piece, leaving nothing to the poor, treating the poor literally like dirt, God's judgment was coming upon them. And this is a common theme of all of the prophets of Israel. There was a duty from God to take care of the weak, the widow, the poor, the orphan, the stranger in the land. And when preachers preach about this, people say, now you're getting into politics. Shouldn't mention these things. And yet that's part of the prophetic tradition that makes up the backbone and spine of the morality of the scriptures. So much so, the prophets would say, if you're not doing this, you could say all the prayers you want, have all the sacrifices in the temple you want, won't amount to a hill of beans. Now, the sacrifices and prayers are good, but they have to be united with the love of neighbor. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean government programs. Every member of the tribes of Israel was supposed to look out for their neighbor, for those around them. It wasn't a central government that was controlling uh, currency prices. It was individual merchants and business people. All of them had a moral responsibility. And all of us have the same type of responsibility to look out for one another so that God can look out for us and care for us. And the truth is, any one of us even if we're riding pretty high financially, career-wise, everything else, and one moment could have our whole lives turned around and need to depend on others. When the mills were still booming in this valley, I heard so many steel workers from the blast furnace to open hearth say things like, oh, I'll never ask for public assistance. I'll always be able to get a job to support my family, to work with my hands. I'll never, like the first in the gospel, have to beg. And then when the mills went down all at once and there were thousands of men looking for work from Aliquippa to Toledo, then they had to sing a different tune. And the same could happen to any person at any given moment. And so we try to enrich ourselves by the things we give away, by the things we share with others. That begins to make us strong in the things of the Spirit. Now, in today's second reading, the letter to Timothy, we see the inspired author saying, pray for those in authority, that we might live tranquil lives. And those in authority at that time were Roman emperors and governors and procurators, were totally ruthless. They pray for those in authority who are having and sponsoring games around the Mediterranean world where people would slaughter one another for sport. Now we just bang one another up in the NFL. (laughs) But, said pray for those people. 
they were thinking they were gods. And they were asking for sacrifice to be offered to them. Talk about hubris and inflated egos. And they said, pray for them. Now this was the Jewish solution to living within the Roman Empire. Because when the Romans conquered the whole Mediterranean world and up through Europe, even into England, everywhere they expected sacrifice to be offered to the emperor as if he was a god. The Jews couldn't do that. And the Romans were astute. They knew when to be rigid and when to be flexible. They said, this is going to cause us a lot of headaches. So the Jews promised to pray for the emperor. They wouldn't pray to the emperor, but they'd pray for the emperor. And that's what the Christians were doing, that same solution. And they were longing just to be left alone from this empire that was so powerful. Longing to be able to live their lives in peace and tranquility without an intrusion of the empire on their inner lives. Uh, it didn't work out. <laughs> Before the century was over, Christians were being slaughtered by that empire in great numbers. But that was the spirit. And then also the author of Timothy says, when the believing community is praying to God for mercy, let's leave all the bickering behind. Let's leave all the anger and rage behind. Pray in peace and tranquility so that peace and tranquility could reign on the church and the believing community. And in every church and every uh, parish around the world, there's always conflict, some gossip, some disagreement, some people get their feelings hurt. It's part of human nature. But the ideal is when it comes to the prayer, the prayer life of the church, to pray in tranquility and peace as we raise our hands to God. And there are times when people say, well, we should pray this way and not that way, the other way, we should use this language or that, this music or another music, and there's friction, part of human nature. But the ideal is to pray in heart, mind, and soul with one another for the world in which we live because the Lord of this world wills that everyone, including evil politicians, ultimately be saved by having a change of heart. Tremendous challenge from that letter to Timothy, a young bishop in the ancient church. Now, Jesus in today's gospel passage gives us a very complex parable. It's hard to translate well. But he says, people that are trying to get by in this world and only this world, they know how to do it. Even if they have to lie and cheat, they find the way. So here's a fellow that's been embezzling from his master. He's caught, ouch. <laughs> so, all right, straighten out the books. Let me know what's happening and then you're out of here. And one of those classic lines, gee, I'm not strong enough to dig ditches. I, I can identify with that. Uh, one time I tried to bury a cat, it was tough. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to beg, I'm unable. And so he said, what will I do? And he marks down all the debtors to his master. He's caught, but the master said, well, that was pretty clever. I'll give you credit for that. That's sort of like your going away pay. Don't come back uh, ever again. Don't call me and I won't call you. <laughs> but at least now you have a place to go because these people will say, this is a nice guy. He really helped us. And Jesus said, now how are you going to become rich in the things of the kingdom? He said, well, you might have a lot of dishonest wealth or honest wealth come your way. What you do with it will determine whether or not you're rich in the kingdom of God so that when you finally go home from this life, you'll really go home to where your treasure lies, which is that place where love of God and love of neighbor alone rules.